Good morning and welcome to the College Church Sabbath School. My name is Roger. We welcome everyone online as well as uh, folks in the audience. We anticipate maybe a bigger class than we normally have. Bible Bowl. Bible Bowl is today, but I'm joined with my partner in crime. Thomas Bloom. And we are continuing our journey through the book, uh, the Gospel of John. We are on lesson number four, yep. covering the 19th through the 25th of October, and the title of the lesson is Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. And before we get started, uh, Tom, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the beauty of New England that fall. Father, we ask that multiple blessings be poured out on the Bible Bowl today as the students show off their knowledge. Father, be with us now as we open the pages of your word. Help us to understand what you would have us understand. And we thank you and we love you. In thy name, amen. Amen. And uh, for those who are uh, not normally with us, we encourage participation in the class. Yeah, we're both teachers, so we're going to ask questions. We only ask that uh, <laughs> when you want to speak, you raise your hand because we do broadcast this online. Yep. And nobody can hear you at home if... So you don't have the microphone. So if you raise your hand, Doug will bring a... This young man will bring you a microphone. Microphone, and we will uh, move forward. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a state of being, Doug. It's a state of mind, all right? <laughs> Relative statement, Doug. <laughs> um, You're young to somebody, there, Doug. Yeah, there, there are people <laughs> older than you here. <laughs> um, so we, last week we did the prologue of John and the week before that we kind of it was a lesson like this one where we kind of bounce around yeah um this lesson's kind of put together where we're talking about themes in the gospel of John whether rather than like we did with Mark right we started at the beginning and we read through till the end very verse by verse this one kind of has us jumping around thematically which I understand but I'm not necessarily personally a fan of because it doesn't really give you that that complete narrative that view of the narrative of, of uh, as a whole what John's trying to say right. um, it strikes me as kind of proof texting I know that the general conference editorial offices hold with bated breath what our opinion is of their editors but <laughs> um, <laughs> joke joke my opinion doesn't really matter but this this week we're, we're talking basically about people who take notice of the things that Jesus is doing, the things that Jesus is saying that are evidentiary points in identifying him as the Jewish Messiah. Right. So if you remember from Mark, I harped on it a lot in our Mark study. If you remember from Mark, uh, I constantly repeated the refrain, and I'll repeat it again one more time, that Mark's main point was he wanted you to see the authority of Jesus. Jesus is one who speaks with authority. He has authority over the scriptures. He has authority over sickness and death. He has authority over nature. He has authority over even the unclean spirits. And so now John is here writing and he says, this is, he wants, well, in this particular lesson study, one of the things that we're to see is, here is the one who was promised. Here is the one who we can identify as the Messiah. And within that theme, and actually before I let you start uh, commenting, Tom. Okay. I just want to read our memory text. Yep. It's John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, that's taken from Jesus's interaction with Nicodemus under the cover of darkness late at night. Which is what, Thursday? Uh, I'm not really sure, honestly, yes, but we Thursday. can just do it however we do it. But you noticed sort of sub-themes yes. that we were talking before. You noticed a few sub-themes. Um, why don't you tell us about so that? So the, the sub-themes that I saw, I understood the main themes that the, the Sabbath School writer was trying to write, but I noticed what really stood out to me was two sub-themes in these stories. And one of those sub-themes is, one, word of mouth. Okay? Every one of these stories had word of mouth in it. There was no, you know... He sent a letter, that kind of stuff. There was no electronics, obviously. There was, it was all 
hey, guess what I saw? All right, and based on the strength of the relationship that that person had with the person that they were talking to, made it so that the contact was made with Jesus. Okay, so that's one. That's one sub-theme. And the other sub-theme that I saw was personal touch. They went to their friend. They had a burden on their heart to go to their friend and say, hey, I've seen this guy. You need to see him too. Come along. You know, and there's a, there's some mini, you know, authority. Okay, this is, you know, we have, he's the Messiah, or he's the promised one, or, 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 that we've been looking for, which means that these guys were already into their Bible, into their records, right, the Torah, and they had been absolutely looking for the Messiah to come, right? So again, two themes, personal touch, and word of mouth are big throughout both of these stories or all the stories that we go over and that makes sense on some level right because people people aren't going to know what you know or know what you think or you believe unless you tell them and if you look at if you if we project forward a little bit into the rest of the first century The only reason Christianity flips the Roman Empire upside down in just over a hundred years is because people just talked about what they knew and what they believed. And I think that's an important lesson for us because... Well, and I'm sitting here thinking 21st century, right? What is it that we do in the 21st century? Drop on an email, text them, Google it. Okay, where's the one-on-one, where's the personal touch? Do you, do you feel a personal connection when you get a text from your friend? I mean, there's, there's etiquette with this stuff. I don't even have to answer a text until like tomorrow if I don't want to kind of thing, right? You know, so there's no personal touch. There's no, my friend took time, time out of their day to come to me and say, hey, this is something that you need to see. We've lost that in the 21st century. Now, you could say, well, you know, we're so much more advanced than all the rest of that sort of stuff. They had to go and talk, right? But what could they have done? Oh, go read your Torah again, you know? There's, because he, Jesus wasn't the only Messiah figure available at this time. I mean, in our, in, on Sunday, we had another Messiah figure that they were already talking about. People were going, you know, is John the Baptist the Messiah? You know? So there's lots of Messiah figures out there. But these guys said, no, this is the one. And we've, we've lost that in the 21st century, in my humble opinion. So let's just start there with Sunday, John the Baptist, the testimony of John the Baptist. Of course, we, you know, we kind of understand, we already come with a lot of background knowledge about who John the Baptist was. He's an Elijah figure. He's pointing people towards... Uh, revival, repentance, faithfulness in God. I do want to point out, because this is what I do, um, I, want you, I want to try to give you an idea of some of the cultural and historical context that's uh, going on here. Right here uh, in the... Where am I at? Sunday. Oh, the... Well, yeah, Sunday, but the middle of the first paragraph. It says... Some Jews in Jesus' time expected two messiahs, one priestly and the other royal. And there's a lot of background to that. And you can glaze over that and not really understand what's going on, why that would get pointed out. And I wish we would go more in depth with that in the Sabbath school lesson, but we don't. But just a real quick Old Testament history lesson. A little irony, a little Old Testament irony, actually. So Saul is, ki- is cast away by God. Saul is rejected as king over Israel. Does anybody remember the specific event? Yeah, what did Saul do? That caused Samuel to inform Saul, because you have disregarded God, God's going right. to disregard you. Say it again. He disobeyed. Yeah, he didn't destroy the Malachites, and before the battle, he did what? 
he offered a sacrifice. Right. And why was that offering of the sacrifice invalid on his part? Uh, he wasn't a priest, he was a king. There you go, there you go. Fast You're have to run faster, Doug. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Fast forward, <laughs> fast forward to David. What does David do? He off no, he offers sacrifice. David gets the criticism of his wife because after the return of the Ark of the Covenant, he's dancing through the streets wearing just one garment, an undergarment called an ephod that was only to be worn by priests. What changed between Saul and David? Why was David authorized to offer sacrifice and act in a priestly role and Saul was not? Anybody have any idea? We have online people that yeah. like to hear what you have to say. A couple of things happening like um, like they kind of lost their way of knowing what was in the Torah because Uzzah touched the, uh, the ark and died. And there was a lot of things that was going on as far as knowledge of the scripture and God winks at ignorance. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that also going on, the ignorance of the scriptures, of what was happening? I think some of that certainly was going on. Um, but there's a specific thing that happened in the history of David and his leadership of Israel that authorized him to offer those sacrifices and act in a priestly role. Does and anybody? it's a military conquest. Yeah, think about it. It's a military yeah. conquest that he performed, which authorized him to have priestly and office. And when I, when I learned this, it was like, like mind blowing to me. Yeah. Who was king of Jerusalem when Abraham heard the call to God? Melchizedek. And what is Melchizedek called? priest to God most high. When David conquers Jerusalem, he's conquering a king. And when he takes political control of Jerusalem, he inherits all of the titles. It's a very medieval type of way of thinking, right. but he inherits all of the titles that the king he conquered also holds. So David conquers Jerusalem, he becomes king of Jerusalem, and he inherits that ancient title, priest to God most high. Read in the Psalms, Psalms 80, it's 80 something, I something think. Something like that, yeah. But it's quoted in Hebrews in the New Testament. I am a priest, ye are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. David, uh, Jesus is the heir the legitimate heir of David, therefore Jesus inherits all of David's earthly titles. So the expectation of having two messiahs is are actually, it's actually a disconnect from, it's an insertion of the intertestamental period's thinking. Because during that time, right, you had the, the Maccabean revolution, you had all these different things going on, everything became very secularly political. And those, those people who had those expectations of what the Messiah would be were imbibing those cultural influences, I guess you could say. And they're not looking for a legitimate heir to the throne of David, which would have been by nature, by title, both king in Jerusalem and priest to God most high. And in Jesus, you have those two things unified. Yeah. And John the Baptist goes out of his way to say, that's not me. It's not me. All right. Gentleman over here. And then we got a gentleman Sorry over Sorry for all the exposition, but I want to make yeah. sure that we kind of start see, off right. We, we miss a lot of that culture. So, if you're saying that, then when Jesus was here on earth, why did he say that my kingdom is not here? When Pilate asked him about his kingdom, because if he inherit um, that from David, then that makes him king and priest mm -hmm. while he was here by inheritance only, right? But then he doesn't, he doesn't get kingship 
until he takes off the, the, um, I forgot the thing it's called. Um, until he puts on his uh, priestly robes and then he inherits to be king to, to rule, right? According to biblical understanding. So help me to understand that part of the scriptures versus what you're saying using a medieval terminology of inheritance through kingly and ministerial positions. The best answer I can give you is that the preposition, Doug, Doug. the preposition Wait, that we you? use in English of, Gentleman right here. we use it in when Jesus, we usually take it as when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, we take it as it's not a part of this world. But that preposition could also mean origin. Jesus' Jesus's origins as king and as priest are not, they, he doesn't derive his authority from this world. So to your point, the, the, the authority, to go back and kind of connect it to Mark, the authority that Jesus is exercising isn't because he is the heir of David in the earthly sense. That's a sign. And that's what John the Baptist is pointing to. That's what um, this whole lesson's kind of made up. We, we see signs that Jesus is who he claims to be, right? He will actually, we, we believe that the, the Messiah, the, 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 the mess, Messiah, the, well, the, again, the two Messiahs to come will exercise priestly role and kingly role. In Jesus, we have that unified into one. But his authority, so when he's talking to Pilate, kind of a different scenario, but when he's talking to Pilate, he's ta I, I, I would read that in Greek as he's talking about the origins of the world because Pilate is exercising kingly authority under the auspices of the Roman Empire. He's challenging Jesus based on the accusations made against him because the claim to be a king when Caesar hasn't made you a king is to commit the act of high treason and therefore warrant death. He's asking Jesus a technical question based on Roman law you, they say you're a king. And then Jesus says, you say, you say I'm a king. Then he says, but my kingdom is not, if I am a king, my kingdom's not of this world. If, it, if my kingdom was of this world, my followers were, would fight. You would, you would, he would, you would do what, it, what you expect of an earthly kingdom to do, but my kingdom's not an earthly kingdom. That doesn't mean it just exists up there. Is Jesus the king here? Most certainly. I don't think you could deny that. But his title, his authority doesn't originate from the earth. Pilate's did, Caesar's did, Herod's did, the high priest in Jerusalem in the Old Testament system did because it was based on the tabernacle alone. That's where the high priest operated. Jesus' high priesthood comes from something deeper, right? I know that I, I, maybe I'm not making much sense to you. I can, we can, oh, that's okay. That's all good. I wasn't trying to push us off on a, on a, on a tangent, but I, yeah. And I can see that that's why the Jews were looking for Jesus to come. Well, that's why they did not accept him as the Messiah, because they was looking for him to come as king, an earthly king. Correct. Not as a priest. Right. So that's why they did not, partly that's why they did not accept him. And they were prejudiced towards him because of that thinking. Right. And in reference to priesthood as well, that same thing, where is his priesthood located? His priesthood's not located in, his priesthood's not located in the earthly temple. The earthly temple ceases to exist, but Jesus' high priesthood doesn't cease to be effectual after right. the temple's gone. Right. Just like once Jerusalem's no longer the center of Jewish worship, he still remains the, the, the legitimate and, and uh, king of the Jews. But um, I don't know, I, I want to I try to answer your question better, but I don't want to get like off in the weeds. I want to I talk about it more, but I want to continue on the lesson. But find me after and I'll talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> um, but John the Baptist, so we, we got John the Baptist. John the Baptist yep. recognizes Jesus for who he is. Um, they come to him, like you said, saying, is this guy the Messiah? Yep. John the Baptist does not fulfill any of the prerequisites, except that he could, again, here, here we go again, he could legitimately become king if he were to lead a 
military rebellion against the Roman government and seize power in Jerusalem. John the Baptist says, I'm nothing about that. Yes, Mike. Well, just as another follow-up to this is that in the wilderness, Satan had offered Jesus the kingship of this world. Correct. Which he, of course, refused. Um, and, and in addition to that, the three angels' message is about Jesus, the coming king, who is the creator of the universe. And, 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 and that's the, we are the John the Baptist of our time. Uh, that we, we that's, that's the message. Jesus is first come with John the Baptist that we're studying. We are the John the Baptist of his second coming. We are Elijah. We are to deliver the Elijah message. I mean, I believe there's a reference to that in the spirit of prophecy somewhere. That we're to deliver the last times Elijah message. Um, moving on to, I just want to move on to Mondays and try to connect the two. Of course, when, when they're, they're inquiring whether John the Baptist is the Messiah, he says no. no. One day Jesus shows up to where he's preaching at the Jordan River. Like out of the blue. Out of the blue to uh, everyone else's sort of perspective. And they have this byplay, right? Jesus talks with his cousin and says, you've got a job to do. And what was that job? He had to baptize him, right? John had to baptize Jesus. Okay, and John's like, dude, <laughs> I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, it's prophesied. We, this is, has to be done this way. So he goes through with it, right? But off to the side are a couple of John the Baptist's followers, right? Everyone's, you know, they're collecting these people that are, that are, gathering, that are gathering around. I don't know what these guys did for work, but because apparently they follow a lot of people around all day long. But two of these guys are setting off to the side, and they come to John afterwards, and they say, who's this dude that you talked about, right? So who are those two guys? Who are, the, who are the two followers of John the Baptist initially? Philip and Andrew. Very good. Okay, and so what do they do? <laughs> well, hang on a second. Who are you? You know? Who are you? And so the, to me, there's that, that word of mouth connection. Like they, they don't know who Jesus is from Adam. Excuse the metaphor and the pun. Okay, all right. But they trust what John the Baptist has to say. And he goes, you need to go check this guy out. He's the one. And so what do they do? They do. They, they run after Jesus to find out what he's about. And then what do they do? They go talk to their own brothers. And, they, and you know, and, and out it goes. By one simple act, Jesus starts this ripple effect of people recognizing who he is, trusting the, the words of the person that spoke about him, and so it begins, and his ministry begins. And he uses a very specific term, the title of the lesson for Tuesday, some Monday, um, he calls Jesus the Lamb. That's how he identifies Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the lesson it says, Consider deeply Jesus' title as the Lamb of God. What images does it bring to mind and how does it link? How does its linkage to the Old Testament sacrificial system help you appreciate the great price of our salvation? Anybody want to take a stab at that question? Well, go ahead, my friend. No, it's all good. So there's a couple of things happening here, right? So John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Ghost, right? He was not taught by man, but he was taught just like Peter. In, in the wilderness, right? Oh, not, not Peter, Paul, um, in, in the wilderness. His disciples recognize this man is different from everyone else. And he's referring him, 
he's, he's the herald of the coming of Jesus. So he, he instructs them of the ways of the sanctuary. So when he recited that, they took it as saying, this is the one that we see every month, every day, mm-hmm. every, every once a year. This, this, is, this, is, this is what we have lived for to see. So I think um, that was an, uh, definitely a, 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 a um, part of history that was like once in a lifetime for anybody to be like, this is the Lamb of God. This is the one I've been teaching and preaching about. Well, I mean, I don't, you're 100% true. The only thing that I would add from that, from the historical context of what was going on, there were multiple messiahs in the land, people claiming to be messiah. So if you're reading the local newspaper, okay, and saying, okay, so-and-so claimed to be messiah today, okay, we got to go debunk him, right? He ain't it, you know, that kind of stuff until they get to Jesus, and then there's no debunking that takes place. You're absolutely right. He's the one. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, um, so you said earlier about touch and the way things are spread or whatever. The, the touch or me telling somebody one-on-one means nothing. If I have the Spirit of God in me, it's not me that's convincing you. It's the Holy Spirit that's convicting you. And I think John was so full of the Holy Ghost that that conviction to say that there goes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, each one of us have a measure of faith. And I think the lifestyle that John lived and the things that John has done prove to that fact. So when he said that, I think his disciples was like, yo, he's right. I want to see. And then he tried to taste and see. I don't think those are two different things, right? Because John's, ha- John's building a relationship with people. And, he's, and they're seeing the type of person that he is. Because you say, like, the life that we live will reveal to people, right? Is am I understanding what you're saying? Sort of like the legitimacy? What I was saying is, I don't think the method of being next to someone or talking to someone, have a relationship with someone, matters as much as the spirit in a person. And the only reason I'm saying that, because we see it all the time, we see voice of prophecy. I don't know um, Sean Boonstra. But the fact of the matter is, is that what he's explaining may be truth, and he's coming from a, a place. It's not Sean Boonstra's words that brings people to Christ, the Holy Ghost. So I I think we play a role, but the the, the deciding role of people to come or go, I think that's the Holy Ghost. I just think we just need to be available in any capacity. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, Anything else? Actually, I want to, I want, anybody else want to try and answer the question? Yes, sir. I think the fact that John says, behold the lamb, I think that's what made the difference. And it pointed people back to the sacrificial system, knowing that Jesus was come as the lamb. And they were studying that. And I don't know if the other, they were expecting other messiahs. Maybe they were not saying that. But when John says, behold the lamb of God, Mm -hmm. and then they look at the sacrificial system that pointed towards the lamb that was coming. I think that's what made the difference. And when we look at that, we recognize that we are the one that, in the sacrificial system, the person that committed the sin, he put his hands on the lamb's head and, and, you know, and he slit the lamb's throat. And so that's what Jesus did for us. And I think that brought the connection and helped us understand the great sacrifice that we played on our behalf. Mm-hmm. And when John says, behold the lamb of God, I think that was a connecting link. So I don't think, I don't know if the other people were saying who was looking for other messiahs, were saying the lamb. And I think that was connecting link when John said that his disciples, they were, maybe they were studying. And that was connection, like, like the lesson said, points back to the Old Testament sacrifice. Well, okay, so, what, so what's the difference? The Pharisees understood, right? They, they were s- scholars of, of the gospel, right? So why are they not recognizing Jesus as the Messiah? 
I mean, if they say he's the Lamb of God, it, there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. Knowing the Bible isn't the only, okay, and don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Knowing the words of the Bible aren't the only reason why you come closer to Christ. Understanding what he's saying. The, the Pharisees knew the words. They knew the words better than anybody else, but they didn't see, they didn't feel the connection. Okay, that's the difference that, that, that I'm talking about. Okay, John's disciples were searching with open hearts for the Spirit of God. Okay, absolutely. They knew, and once John said, they, they were off like a shot. They didn't even, you know, John, you're done. We're done with you. Okay, nicely, but we're done with you. Yeah. Right? There's a difference. They had to be open. The rest of Judea wasn't necessarily open to this idea of the Lamb of God. Right, because they were looking for that earthly king again. I think that's what clouded that, that judgment. They were looking for an earthly king right. to deliver them. And that's what confused them. They got, uh, when Jesus came as this lowly man. And an earthly priest. Okay. Right. And but, the sacrificial system had been turned into something it wasn't supposed to be. Right. They made it, like when Jesus cleansed the temple, you know, they right. made it, they was making money. It was machinery at that <laughs> right. point. Right. <laughs> it became mechanical to them. Yeah. They didn't recognize. It was just like, just going through the routine. Yep. It lost his religious significance to him. Go ahead, Doug. Keep the mic near you, please. I was just going to say, obviously, the scribes and Pharisees were threatened by Christ. They had their own pride, their own thoughts. Uh, who are you, this newcomer coming in? You weren't even schooled, you know, in, in the synagogue like the rest of us were. You know, you, you're the carpenter's son. So they had all these things against Christ that um, they, really their pride got in the way. You know, they just wouldn't listen. They had their preconceived ideas. And you're not going to disrupt the status quo. But nobody would have ever said, you don't know the scriptures to the scribes and Pharisees. No, they had them memorized. <laughs> but there's, yes, Doug. Let's bring it back to today. What's that say about our own interpretation of scripture today? If the Pharisees were so well-versed and they had it wrong, what does that tell us about our condition? How far are we in maybe potentially misinterpreting what Scripture says? You raised a good point, Tom. It's a very good point. The Pharisees should have known better, given the background that they had about the, the, the coming Messiah. But they got it wrong. So I sometimes look at Scripture and say, hey, Lord, as he said a while ago, the, the Holy Spirit is what has to guide me in my process of interpreting Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because I could go in and with my preconceived ideas about what I think it, it is, but it may not be. And that's what we, the Pharisees had big problems with. Their pride, number one, was a big issue. Mm -hmm. it, it's, like, it's like a student coming to us and saying, you're wrong, Professor Bloom. How do we take that? There's a couple of ways. You see what I'm saying? It, it's easily where we could say, well, how dare you to teach right. me? Right. That's one way. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or am I open-minded to potentially listen to a student who may have some data that I don't have? That I don't have. Prove it. That's right. I, I ask us, we ask our students to argue with us and... They yeah. usually don't. You got uh, Bob all the way in the back and then the gentleman here in the okay, front. Okay, so Bob, yeah. I'll get yeah, to Bob. Just going in I order. Just, well, yeah. for, while he's walking to Bob, it says reflect deeply. So let, just one moment, just reflect deeply. What was the purpose of the lamb in the Hebrew temple? It was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice. Who sacrificed the lamb? Yes, the high sir. priest. Yeah. Right, so the sinner who represents the household puts the, puts the hand on there, cuts the throat, the sinner, and the lamb takes the sin of the sinner, and then the priest carries the, the lamb into the temple and uses the blood to minister in the temple. Lamb of 
God. Who's the head of household there? Who's sacrificing? Who's confessing? Uh, I, I won't keep going. I know Bob's got something to say. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Well, you, you went right, right, right past the topic that I, that I rose my hand to. So Bring it on. So you were talking about the people that know the Bible and know it well, but they don't get the concept of it. My son is a good example of it. He knows it backwards, forwards, upside down, and sideways. But yet, and he'll come out with, I want nothing more to do with the Sabbath because it's too restrictive. Mm. So you impose your own will. Yes, sir. You had something yep. too, please. So, what the gentleman said, um, I, I do take some slight issue because when we study the Bible, there's only one interpretation. There can be many applications, but there's only one interpretation. Mm -hmm. The problem with, and, and, that's, and that's scripturally based because there's, the Bible says there is no private interpretation. Right. Right. So there's only one interpretation, but there can be many applications to that interpretation. If the, if the, if the application takes away from the, from the interpretation, then, then your understanding is wrong. The problem with the, um, the Sadducees and the Pharisees during that day is they felt that they had ecclesiastical authority to change the understanding of Scripture to fit their interests. Right. Right. So when they were looking at Jesus and saying Jesus is doing this wrong on the Sabbath, they are doing this, they were taking ecclesiastical authority to change what the scripture says or interpret to fit their narrative that fits the line their pockets. It is not the fact that what we read or how we read it, it is wrong. It is how we interpret it. And if it's breaking the rules of understanding scripture, then that leads to the wrong interpretation. That is why the Sunday keepers are wrong. That is why the Mormons are wrong, because they break the rules of interpretation to fit their narrative. And any time that you see their debates or you see anything and they're going against another denomination, they break their rules of interpretation or put them in the wrong spot. And that was it. That's it. Oh, uh, Doug, Mike. Mike, 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 yeah. Mike up, Mike. Mike, Mike. <laughs> we can go too many places with that. You had said a little while ago that the reason King Solomon was rejected was because he King Saul. Sac Saul. King, what did I say? Solomon. Solomon. King King Saul was rejected was because he sacrificed a lamb. That actually wasn't the reason he was rejected. Okay. You probably want me to explain. Yes, what please. No, correct. <laughs> yeah, tell, me, yeah, tell me I'm wrong and then tell me why. Yeah. The reason he was rejected is because he constantly rejected the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which ultimately culminated in his sacrificing a lamb. Mm. But, it's the, but it's, uh, the real thing was his rejection of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Kind of goes to his point, though, the imposition of your own perspective right. onto the clear teaching of Scripture, right. um, which I think it's a mistake that we all make from time to time. Uh, Doug, right behind you here to your left, this gentleman. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Um, at times you wonder, these doctors of the role, when you read some here, it's saying that um, they were waiting for a Messiah to deliver them from the Roman yoke or readership. And yet the scriptures showed how the Messiah was to come. So I think the major problem, as others have said, is that uh, they were coming the Bible with their own preconceived opinions instead of reading the, leaving the Holy Spirit to guide them. So even when we are looking at John the Baptist coming and the scripture said clear that the voice cries in the wilderness and there's somewhere where it was saying that the work of John in the days um, servants were sent ahead of the king to revel the services of roadways and to take away sharp corners 
so as to smooth the way of the king. So in fulfillment of pro prophecy, John came in order to prepare the hearts of the people for Jesus. Mm. So they even that very clear scripture from uh, J Isaiah, they could not understand it because they did not allow the Bible, the out of the Bible say to them, speak to them. And I think this is a problem of emanetics, the Bible interpretation. People come with their preconceived opinions and then they end up getting it wrong. So the doctors of the law got it wrong because they did not allow the one who inspired the writing of the scriptures to guide them. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, because that's an ex excellent, excellent point. And we're running low on time. So, yes, sir, please. Just want to make sure. We have to finish at 1050. I've been given orders from my commanders. Yeah, no worries. So, so what I was going to say was that... Um, that because of what John was doing and he was outreaching and because of his preaching, um, so many people were not only just hearing the message, but he was causing such an impact. And because of that impact, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were sending people to go out and listen to what he was saying. And so the word was coming back into the Sadducees and the Pharisees of what uh, John was actually preaching. And so when Jesus comes and gets baptized and Jesus now has a following with the disciples and that leads to okay well now miracles are happening but this leads to then Nicodemus who then wants to have that conversation with Jesus but he doesn't want to do it publicly with all the Sadducees and all the Pharisees but he wants to know okay well he wants to investigate it for himself because if all the claims of all that's been happening is true then this could be the Messiah that they've been looking for. And you can see that God's been working, trying to reach out to the Sadducees and the Pharisees the entire time, while also trying to reach out to all the children of Israel. And the thing is that's so key about it is that uh, John the Baptist, when he's preaching and he's proclaiming the good news that the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world is here, he's proclaiming that the Lamb of God is here, that... All these people are supposed to be, you know, like, hey, guys, like, this is Jesus. This is the one. This is the one we've been waiting for. It's been 500 years of silence. And we don't, we don't have the earthly kingly priest that we expected. Instead, God sent us the lamb. This, was the, this is the right guy. And now Nicodemus is researching this for himself. And that's when Jesus has that conversation with him. And when Jesus does have that conversation, he tells him, if I tell you of heavenly things and you don't understand that, then, then I, if I explain to you something that's, uh, that's physical or, temp or something that's like the season's changing, then you should be able to understand that at least. And that's when he explains to him, John chapter 3, going to verse 14, where he says, like Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, mm -hmm. that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. He's bringing Nicodemus right back to what happened in the wilderness so that he can remember Deuteronomy. Because uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the, uh, the book of Exodus, those things are so key to, to being a Jew. And he wants them to understand and to remember, hey, this is where you came from. This incident was so vital that having the serpent raised up in the wilderness is a parallel to what's going to happen to Jesus, you know, three and a half years later or three years later, roughly around that time. And so that's something that we then see uh, come on Thursday. All right. Uh... You have, to, you have to go really fast because I only have three minutes. <laughs> I'd just like to say the, the takeaway, like you always say in the beginning, they were sharing what they heard and seen. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need to share Jesus with others. And that's the takeaway. You know, we like to sit on debate and everything, but it's to share with others what God has revealed to us. Mm -hmm. And I will leave you this, with this. I'm going to get Tom and I in trouble, but I know he agrees with me. <laughs> Who, where did this start? It started with a bunch of uneducated fishermen and a crazy guy preaching in the wilderness. And who tried to shut it down? The learned ones. So be careful how much stock you put in people like us, teachers, mm -hmm. or the pastors, sorry mm -hmm. if any of you are in here, 
but God uses the most counterintuitive methods for reaching people. And he does things that are unexpected because we impose our own cultural blinders onto the scriptures. You have anything to wrap up with? You're good. Um, All right. (laughs) So (laughs) we're going to, no, you don't want to, you don't want to add to that? Updating my resume as we speak. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But seriously, guys, like it's us. And I say us, it's just the people. God's going to use the people. And when Tom started us off with that, that individual touch, that personal touch and connection, that's what he does. Um, Jesus got down and dirty. He didn't go to the, the temple to announce himself. He didn't go to the palace. He started out with a bunch of teenagers. Teenagers. We teach teenagers. Mm-hmm. If my kids came to my class on Monday and started trying to tell me that we had it all wrong and we need I'd be like, listen, I'm in charge here. Sit down. <laughs> but that's the point. Right. That's right. the point. Would I have the courage to put my own preconceptions aside and perhaps listen to what the Holy Spirit's trying to teach me through a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old. Um, we have 30 seconds. So, uh, Tom, do you want to pray? You st- sure. open prayer? All right. I can close. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we've opened your scriptures. Father, we believe that the Holy Spirit is here guiding us. Father, help us to understand what you would have us to know, not what we think we know but what you would actually have us to know. Father, we love searching your word for you and your revealing of yourself to us. Father, be with us now as we go into our sacred service. We thank you and we love you and we can't wait to go home. In thy name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody who made it easier to teach because you did most of the talking. Yeah, it's beautiful that you guys talk.